All right, guys, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We're back with Brian Weissman. Hey, Brian. Hey, guys. All right, so this is the last video of this awesome series regarding the deck. A uh, brief history. I mean, I wouldn't call it brief. It's been over an hour plus. Yeah, so many, <laughs> many things I do involving talking are brief. So. And uh, this is going to be the sideboard video. Uh, this is probably one of the more important conversations, I think, because the choices you make here will determine if you win the matches or not. Uh, Brian, take it away, man. All right, um, I'll try to be relatively quick here and just go over. Now keep in mind, sideboard is certainly one of the most malleable components of, of any deck and certainly of the control deck that I play. It changes almost on a whim, give or take a couple of cards. I think that there are a few cards that are staples and are non-negotiable, but most of the cards are um, can, can rotate in depending on what I expect to be playing against. So I have, my, my sideboard is pretty balanced right now. I'd say it's tilted a little in favor of dealing with control decks. It's sort of split between dealing with control decks and dealing with really devoted aggro, especially burn-related aggro. And as Daniel pointed out when we were talking earlier, uh, he asked me what I had to sideboard against a deck like Mono Black. And then looking at the deck, I actually don't really have too many answers against it, which means that I feel that the core deck is reasonably well set up to fight against a Mono Black deck. Um, not ideal, certainly. I think cards like uh, Control Magic and balance are good against decks like that, but overall I think this, I, I would say that I would be favored against it um, in a majority of games. But I'm going to go to the cards here. My first sideboard card is Circle Protection Red. A singleton, and, huh? Yeah, singleton of those. Um, back in the day I ran two of these, but I haven't, looking at most lists, I haven't really seen a, uh, a lot of dedicated burn decks. There are lots of decks that run four or even eight lightning bolts, but I don't even think I would use Cup Red against them. Mainly because those decks tend to be using their bolts as creature removal rather than as opponent removal. And if they're building their decks and playing their decks correctly, like the blue-red strategies, they would be taking out at least half their lightning bolts, maybe even five or six of them, because they have better things to deal with the control matchup. Things like energy flux and their own elemental blasts and stuff. They're going to be cutting bolts, so you'll look like a fool if you're running cop red against the blue-red player who has two bolts in his deck or something after sideboard. <laughs> um, Mainly a really, really powerful card against things like goblins. And because they just don't have any way to get rid of it short of something like Numeral's Disc, which they would be using. Along those lines, I'm running a second copy of Moat. Second copy? The first one, yeah. Yep. So Moat is anti Jazam, anti Urnum Jin, anti Factory. They're uh, the type of deck that Moat was really, really powerful against, which was a um, sort of zoo style deck that was played quite a bit with Savannah Lions and Kurt Apes and Whirling Dervishes and uh, Elvish Archers and stuff. That deck is, I haven't really seen that deck used in too many too many lists. A lot of people run Savannah Lions. Savannah Lions um, is big. Yeah, but Bolts and Swords tend to handle Savannah Lions pretty well. So I don't even know if I would use Moat as a countermeasure against Savannah Lions. It is good against Factory and the fact that I'm not using Mishra's uh, makes the Moat a little bit better than that regard, except for the fact that I have a way more potent weapon against Factories in the form of the Red Enchant, which is coming soon. Um, more white cards. Two Divine Offering and a single copy of Dust of Dust. By the way, a side note, guys. I kind of understand why he's not doing Mishra's Factories because by having Moat, there's no really no point. And then by not wasting mana to tap the, for the Mishra's Factory, you're allowing your resources to do other effects that are more important. That's, that's very interesting. Yeah, people have talked a great yeah. deal about how Factories are something you can just sort of shoehorn into your deck because they cost you so little to use. I don't agree that they cost you so little to use. And more importantly, you can't reliably use them as defenders against decks that are running white and red mana. Because right. you sit there and you try to use a factory to block a creature, you will, that allows them to basically pay one red mana to stone rain you, and which costs you a land drop, and their creature hits you anyway. So it's not like the factories are a reliable counter to anything. They can work sometimes, and they can certainly hold off an army if you draw them and your opponent draws nothing else. But I don't feel that they're reliable enough to warrant losing the slots. And plus, there's the whole balance versus uh, strip mines anyway. All right, sorry guys, we went a little off track. We have Divine Offering yeah. and Dust to Dust. Two Divine Offerings and Dust to Dust. This, this is the balance that I'm running currently. Um, I've also gone the other way. Two Dust to Dust and one Divine Offering. Obviously, they only deal with artifacts, but there are quite a bit of there are quite a lot of devoted artifact strategies in the format right now. People using yes. Suchi, yes. Uh, Suchi and Relic Barrier and Winter Orb and Howling Mine and Black Vice, which is often unrestricted. And these are, of course, excellent in the mirror match too against the decks running tomes and scepters. So this may be the wrong number. Depending on your metagame, you could even run a second dust to dust. It may be it may be right to run a total of. Uh, eight artifact kill after sideboard. 
I think back in the day I ran uh, two and one or sometimes just two dust to dust. So real quick, I mean, what are we swapping for the dust to dust and the divine well, offerings? One usually? thing as far as sideboarding and building a sideboard, and this yeah. is something to always consider. If you are building a sideboard, you need to ask yourself, if I play against X deck, and this is something I could talk about in a later video, what am I taking out? What am I putting in? Because it's very easy to go and put nine cards in your sideboard that you think you're going to bring in against a control deck. But then when you go to actually sideboard, you go, well, I can remove three of my four sorts of plowshares. I'll take the mode out. I can remove the bolts, but that's only six. And I need to bring in nine. So I've got these three extra cards in my sideboard I can't really use without gutting some core part of my strategy. And maybe I'll cut a land because I'm going second or whatever reason, but you can't really get away with it. So don't put more cards into your sideboard than you can very easily and automatically rotate into your deck. It seems like a no-brainer thing, but I've been guilty of that myself, where I go pawing through my sideboard and see that I just have way more things than I can afford to take out waiting there. Um, so, uh, yeah. yeah, as far as individual matchup, that's something I can get into uh, later. Yeah, 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 yeah. But certainly in, in the category of other things to bring in against control decks. We'll get all four of them now. This takes me up that. to a quad set of Red Elemental Blast. Perfect for the control matchup. Yeah, and, and actually, one thing I've started doing, uh, certainly against the blue-red deck, which I've been doing a bunch of testing against lately, is uh, removing all of my counter spells. I keep... I keep managing them, hmm. like that, but I remove all four counter spells and I rely entirely on white removal and red blasts to beat them. Because of the fact that they often have counter spells and they bring in four red elemental blasts against me. And I don't want those red elemental blasts to be decisive in counter wars. Oh, interesting. I want them to be yeah, stranded in their yeah. hand while I control their creatures with white removal that they can't red blast. Right. Until I, until I play scepters and right. bones or I mind twist them and you can't red blast the mind twist. And it works Pretty, it works extremely effectively to force through a mind twist with red blasts over counter magic. They're sitting there, and I don't know how many hands I mind twisted where the person has two or three red blasts in their hand, and I go, mind twist you, and they go, well, great, I have one counter spell and three red blasts, and I've got two red blasts in my hand. Their whole hand goes into the graveyard, and then I play my blue spells because all the red blasts are gone. And it's the same thing with Scepter. So hmm. counter spell, Manadrain I would never cut because Manadrain right. is too powerful, but I told you before, I don't think that counter spell is a very strong card. It only interacts at one to one, costs two blue mana. It's very easy to fall behind in mana because of red blast. And it's not nearly as efficient or as effective as red blast, especially against decks that have a big blue component with their creatures like Sand of Freaks, because red blast can double its removal as well. So that's this is there's so much blue in the format that uh, going up to four is I think mandatory. And along the lines of other red cards. There, he, there she blows. Of the mighty blood moon. There she blows. <laughs> I only ran two back in the day, and I think that probably is wrong based on the way the current metagame is. I think that against the decks I want blood moon, I want at least three of them. What are we doing here to sideboard? Are you sideboarding out like the, the counter spells? Or um, the swords, maybe? It, it can be very tricky. It depends on the mana base mm. it, of the deck that you're facing, but the decks that blood moon is most effective against tend to be five color control decks. And against those decks, you can definitely cut Source Splashers, you can certainly cut Lightning Bolts, you can cut Moat, uh, you can cut... One of the things I used to do back in the day that I don't honestly think is necessarily correct in retrospect, um, well, I would cut Time Twister against Controller 2, is I would cut the black and green cards. Hmm. Regrowth certainly can be cut, it's not mandatory. Mind Twist is probably too important, but remember, for most of the time, Mind Twist was banned, so it wasn't even an issue. So I would literally cut Tutor and Regrowth. Interesting. Playing, but wow. Yeah, the idea being that if I have Blood Moon in play, and I intend to have it in play, because that's my game plan, I'm not going to be able to cast Regrowth and Demonic Tutor with any degree of reliability, because my four cities of brass don't. God, work. that is so smart. I mean, it's I know crazy, it sounds so. It sounds so weird. Like and now I'm listening here. Right. It makes perfect sense because the odds of you being able to cast Regrowth are too low. Are so low right. and blah. You're, you're, when There's you no play point. Blood Moon, you're making a conscious decision. Yeah. I'm going to muck the game up. It's like putting. It's like yeah. the ultimate win orb in play. I'm going to. I'm going to muck the game up to the point where neither of us can do anything. But you're a little bit more crippled than me. It's like. Right. I'm, I'm a paraplegic, you're a quadriplegic. Right, <laughs> right. right. We're, both, we're both massively handicapped, but you're way more handicapped than I am. And right. that's going to be the difference. Yep. And in that situation, I don't want to be drawing regrowth and demonic tutor when I've got two blood moons sitting in play. And those are just dead draws until I draw my emerald. Got it. Makes so, sense. Perfect sense. So that's why. So I think three blood moons is the right number. And in that, ma in that tournament I played uh, around the new year in New Zealand, I wish I had had four. Because I drew um, the guy that I played against, his deck was absolutely obliterated. It was... It was uh, Three or four color, Jazam Ernan thing with blue counter spells, and it just had it was it was a very greedy mana base. Blood Moon destroyed him, and in the third game, I drew 
Ruby land Soul Ring on the draw. And if I had had Blood Moon going first, I would have just instantly won the game. That deck, the Savannah Lions, Jazam, Urnum thing, that thing won a tournament or two. That's been very popular. Yeah. That four color, yeah. Blood Moon beats for shit. shit I know, I know. So yep, it. I hear you. Um, and especially if you can get Blood Moon fast. If you can get a Blood Moon turn one or turn two, they just lose. Um, so moving on, I have one copy of Mana Short in the deck. And this was a favorite ah, of mine. I love, I love this card. Yeah, I ran two copies of this. I think it's less strong now because people are running more Felwar Stones, and that was something that was not a commonly used card back in the day. But Mana Short, a very important tool to allow you to fight a counter war over a game-ending card like Brain Geyser or Mind Twist during your opponent's end step. It's like, a, it's like the card. It's almost like Quicken. It allows you to basically play a card that would normally be sorcery speed at instant speed. So we're going to fight the counter war during your end step over this mana short. And I have two red blasts in my hand, and the ultimate the ultimate outcome of this is that you're going to wind up being completely tapped out. And on my turn, I'm going to go time walk and time twister. And then you're completely tapped out, and I've got two turns coming, and you can offer no resistance, because force of will is a few years away. So wow. there's a mana short. Um, again, it's a little weakened by the fact that a lot yep. of decks are running three or four, sometimes even four power stones, but... You've got a ton of artifact kill, and you can just nuke their Felwar stones, mana short them out, play play a Blood Moon. They just die on the spot. Very, very, very good card against decks that are running tons and tons of counters. Although if they bring in, um, they bring in lots of red blasts, sometimes the, they'll just blast the short, and you can't really fight a war over it. But at least you're always doing it on your terms and not theirs. And finally, three more artifacts. I have Mirror Universe, and I'm I'm not convinced mm. this card belongs in the sideboard. Yeah. Unlike. Back in the day, Mirror Universe is no longer a win condition. This is much more of just a, a game-warping life gain card as sort of a panic reset button against really aggressive decks that are running tons of burn. The idea being that you can just throw Mirror yeah. Universe out there. You're not intending, you're not going to even mana burn or do yeah. anything. You're no shenanigans with it because they might be able to kill it at instant speed. The idea is you're just going to play Mirror and you're going to say, well, I'm at 7 and you're at 18, yeah. so we're going to switch life here and that's going to change the dynamic of the game. Guys, by the way, you guys go back to the previous videos. Uh, Brian does discuss a little bit of history of the Mirror Universe, uh, yeah, City of Brass, better. and all that kind of stuff. Why it was much it's more much, effective. It's, it's much weaker. And I was... Yeah. Randy didn't have it in his initial list, and I kind of scolded him for it. But having <laughs> played in that tournament, I actually had a game where I, I mirrored the guy at one. I went down to one and did City Mirror. So Mirror right, Universe I mean, is uh, a good sideboard against what? It's, it's good against a deck that's just running a ton of burn spells against you, I think. Got it. And even against a mixture of burning creatures. It can just... I mean, a 10-point life swing can be really huge. Yeah. And it can it can completely change the way that the game unfolds. Especially if you hold the mirror in your hand, you can be a lot more aggressive with your Cities of Brass knowing that they're going to suffer the damage from them down the road. Um, but in that one game I played against the Jazam guy, I had the mirror in my deck, and I mirrored at one. I took him down to one with the mirror, and I couldn't kill him. I had two bolts in my deck, but I didn't draw him. And he eventually just overwhelmed me with creatures anyway. So it, it, obviously back in the day, that would have been a trivial win. Okay. So final two artifacts, I have two copies of Ivory Tower. There this, she is. This card was unrestricted, or was restricted back in the day, along with Black Vice. And I think that there are different rule sets for Vice right now. Yeah, there's as as four, it, four of them? Yeah, I think that Vice is unrestricted. So having Ivory Towers, multiple copies of them. This card is so powerful. I think it's a wise choice. Trying to, yeah. They're trying to kill you with spells. If, yeah. if there are strategies to burn you with spells, Chain Lightning and Lightning Bolt and yeah. Goblin Grenade and stuff, uh, Ivory Tower just guts their deck. You just, it's so backbreaking to play this card earlier in the game. You just sit there, you, you skip one land drop even. You just go, turn one tower, go. Next turn, gain two, hold the card, go. Yep. For the rest of the game, you're gaining three every turn until they deal with the tower. If they're trying to beat with spells, they cannot beat that. It's just, it's too much. It's basically, the card just says, counter spell a lightning bolt every upkeep. Yeah. The next lightning bolt your opponent plays is countered for one mana forever for the whole game. It's too strong. So, and I think two is probably the right number. With one, you just don't see it often enough. Two is just about right. Yeah. So um, that's it. That's the sideboard. I'm guys, what do you guys think? This is a pretty freaking amazing sideboard. I'm a little. There's a, some surprises for me. I I was expecting blue elemental blast. I've seen this so many times, but yeah, no. Amazing. I mean, but your logic makes perfect sense. Yeah, I want honestly against the decks that I would want yeah. blue elemental blast against. I don't want blue cards. Oh, I yeah. should take blue cards because out. if you're doing blood moon, you don't want. Blue Elemental and not Blast. Not just that, but yeah. I, don't want, I don't want to make my opponent's Red Blast good. I want to do everything yeah, I can yeah. to, to gut the power of their Red Blast because Red Blasts are so efficient at owning your counter magic. I guess right. back in the day when Force of Will was around, if, my, if I saw Red in my opponent's deck, I would take Force of Will out of my deck. I would cut all four Forces of Will because it's so bad against Red Elemental Blast. 
You right. just get totally owned. When you're pitching two cards and they're spending one red mana to counter your force, you're screwed. Exactly. You just, you just, you fall so far behind, there's no way to dig your way back out. So against the decks that, that I would want Blue Blast against, yep. I actually remove the blue cards and I beat them with red and white. Red, white, and black. Because they have no answer to those in our effects. Well, Brian, we have a few more a, a few more minutes for a, a one last question. Uh, obviously, guys, again, put in your comments below. I know you have loads of questions to ask Brian. Brian will read them, and uh, he will probably do some follow up videos. But Brian, for someone that's making to starting out with Magic, yeah. watching this the first time, or maybe they've played Magic for a long time, you know, they've seen your your videos now, they've read about you, whatever. Uh, what are some tips um, in when you're playing Magic and also playing the deck so they can start out? And you have a few minutes here just to kind of briefly you know, give them some pointers. Well, um, well, it's a very open-ended question. Sure, sure. I think that the advice that I I try to give to people who are trying to improve at Magic and so a rule that I myself had a hard time really following for a, a long period of time when I was more of a developing player and even when I was playing the game professionally. And the summary of that is essentially, don't get your ego invested in the outcome of the game. Pay attention to what the evidence shows as you're playing. If you're losing repeatedly to someone, it's not because they're getting lucky. It's hmm. because there's something wrong with your deck. There's some, there's some disparity in the matchup, the way the cards are interacting, they're a better player than you. There's a lot of different reasons, but pay attention to the evidence don't blame luck for repetitive negative outcomes. Pay attention to the results and try to look for ways that you can tune and don't have an ego investment in it. If, it's, if your idea is showing repeatedly that it's not working, then your idea is bad and you need to try something else and move on. You'll just totally cripple your development if you chalk up lose, losses to repetitive luck and if you refuse to accept the fact that whatever your cool idea is, isn't panning out versus the metagame or whatever your opponent is playing. If you're able to see that and not have an ego investment in it, you'll continue to develop as a player. And other than that, there is no substitute in Magic for just insane repetition. I have played, I don't know, 25,000 hours of the game probably, <laughs> oh, wow. and probably more than 10,000 hours of control. And they say that to gain a true mastery behavior, you have to play 10, you have to do 10,000 hours of something. And I've certainly put in more than that amount of time playing control decks, probably this deck by itself, and certainly Magic in general. No substitute for just putting in hours. There's no way to get around it. Brian, thank you so much. Brian, do you have a nickname, by the way? Did anybody call you anything? Nah, not just me. All right, guys. If you guys have a nickname for Brian, put it in the comments below. I think it would be cool just to kind of just do a little a fun factor. Brian, thanks again, guys. I'm going to pan one last time. Uh, Brian has been so kind. Seriously, Brian, so kind to share his knowledge, um, just everything. I mean, he's been generous with his time, generous with his just friendship. And, um, I mean, he hinted about some stuff. You don't, you don't know, guys. You guys want him to go to Sweden? What do you got? Put in the comments below. Would you like to see Brian go to Sweden and play at the NoobCom one day? Play at some of those uh, old school tournaments? Um, I sure want to hang out more with Brian and play. Um, and just, you know, just... I mean, he, he's a really great guy. If you guys ever get, get a chance to watch his YouTube channel, um, you know, I'll put the link below of his sure. YouTube channel. He does commander uh, streams, um, and he'll also be doing some article stuff for us and more other videos. I'm sure there's going to be some follow ups. Brian, thanks again. I'm going to do a little. Welcome, I'm going to come, come over and just uh, say hi to Brian. All right, hey. all right, Brian. Thanks again, man. All right, my pleasure. Brian, I consider Brian a friend, and uh, you know, I hope you guys enjoyed the videos like I did. Um, and thanks again. All right, guys. This is the deck signing off. The deck that no one, no one wants to play against. <laughs>